Good morning. Uh, my name is Casey Ream. Um, I have a practice in Los Angeles, uh, Kinch, and I also uh, teach at, at Southern California Institute of Architecture. Um, within the, the kind of overarching idea of a, this being like an experimental architecture uh, biennale um, and this, this uh, request for a kind of manifesto, I, I didn't prepare a manifesto exactly, um, but I, I kind of retuned my lecture a little bit more uh, than I normally do into a kind of myopic aspect of my, of my work um, and also one that... Um, Let's say still in it, still, and I'm going to be showing some stuff that I don't usually show, which is kind of the dirty laundry of the way that I work. So our office uh, uh, and my work it has a kind of really aggressive embracement of automation, not just in terms of a kind of material production, but in um, aspects of the design, like working with different forms of uh, machine intelligence and synthetic intelligence within uh, the design process um, to both kind of... Uh, allow us to rethink how we would interpret the context in which we produce things, but also look for kind of novel forms of organization or aesthetic that kind of emerge out of the way uh, non-human perception engages things. I think the, this first video here is, is a pretty old one now that I should probably retire soon, but I like it, so it won't play again. Um, but it, I, I keep it in here because it, it, it kind of outlines the, the two basic ways that we utilize um, artificial intelligence. I, I did this about three years ago. Um, and it definitely looks extremely dated if you're kind of keeping up with the deep fake world. But um, we have some machines which are able to like, interpret large data sets, in this case, identifying faces from a video stream. And then I have other intelligences which are um, kind of designed or trained to uh, take that interpreted information and then uh, generate a kind of transformative or design content from it. And particularly when I'm dealing with artificial intelligence, this, this workflow um, and these types of models are interesting to me in the architectural world, um, largely because um, you know we rarely are working with a kind of tabula rasa. So machines which have the ability to respond to kind of weird contextual inputs are interesting to me. Uh, I also just really like that kind of Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs guy that just walked by, um, and it's a good way to scare clients when you're doing a Skype chat late at night. Um, so I've, over the years, I've kind of incorporated this work, uh, both in terms of like trying to find ways of uh, um, utilizing uh, kind of vision-based and uh, uh, aesthetic and perceptual forms of intelligence in combination with kind of 3D and 2D geometry and finding ways of connecting them, so kind of collaborating with between like kind of machine vision-oriented things and structural performance-oriented behaviors. Um, this is a kind of an installation for a couple years ago where I did that. Um, but what I want to talk about today is kind of specifically this idea that um, about kind of idiosyncrasy and having a myopic project within the larger kind of territory of automation. And the reason for that is all of these processes, all these kind of frameworks, the kind of parametric framework, there's always a kind of promise of differentiation, of heterogeny. Um, but I think what you find is that the intense amount of labor and energy that goes into the production of these frameworks actually makes it difficult for them to pivot or change. So you, you create maybe differentiation, but all within a very kind of narrow qualitative spectrum. Um, so for me, it's not really an issue of individual designers um, operating that way, but more that I think that there's a kind of more pressing need for an embracing of idiosyncratic um, interests or behaviors in the people engaging with those automated platforms in order to kind of introduce a regularity or um, perversion within those systems. Um, so my particular one, uh, as you could tell from the first slide, tends to do with uh, various forms of like non-human perception, uh, things that are looking at the world or kind of embedded in all of our um, kind of daily technology, which have this kind of different way of viewing um, the kind of public space, the, the digital space, the cultural space, and the physical space than we do, and how the way that those things perceive the space can begin to influence the way that then we reinterpret that, them ourselves as designers. So, for example, um, these are, uh, we just saw these, the, the Kiva robots for a fulfillment center, although I think this one, oh no, this one's from Amazon. I had a Zappos one in here before. Um, these guys navigate the world by looking at tiny grids of QR codes, which you can see on the floor down there. Um, they have a very kind of simplistic way of navigating. It's a kind of uniform grid space, and they're just looking for a specific patterning on the uh, ground surface. 
Um, other things have like a less kind of obvious way of, uh, there's kind of less obvious technologies in terms of um, embedding in the architectural space, but still perceiving us at the same time. Like they have maybe less um, relatable forms of perception. So like a Nest thermostat is something which has a certain perception of um, the way a piece of architecture is inhabited, but um, you know, kind of less analog to you know, the human vision or kind of less obvious like uh, physical presence within the space as something like a robot which is carrying books around. So um, these things have led to, the main project I'm going to be talking about is a, uh, a collaboration I'm doing right now with Benjamin Bratton, who's a kind of social and technological theorist, uh, recently wrote the stack, um, being funded by Google's artists and uh, mach machine intelligence group. And what we're looking at is how we can begin to through kind of a series of speculative exercises, redesign the urban environment based on kind of non-human uh, points of perception for improving the performance of the kind of those, this kind of ecology of non-human users of a space. Um, the first thing that we're going, I'm going to go through is um, improving the city for use in augmented reality apps. Uh, so one of the users that we're looking at is uh, this is from a seminar I taught last spring where students were designing AR apps which they could implement in the city. Um, and one thing about buildings is that they're, they're kind of terrible augmented reality trackers uh, in terms of like locating stuff. So this whole thing's actually grown off of a little piece of graffiti at the bottom of the building. But if your building lacks graffiti, it actually can't really perform very well as a, as a kind of um, armature substrate for an augmented reality application. Uh, the kind of techniques that we're using also evolved out of another seminar I was working on. Um, in this case, we were using uh, cycle-consistent adversarial networks to transform uh, different areas around downtown Los Angeles uh, in relationship to kind of ch changing building codes. In this case, there's a kind of light industrial neighborhood um, that has become rezoned primarily for commercial and retail. So the students were using the network to transform this kind of light industrial neighborhood into the kind of pedestrian developer malls that we're seeing in, in Los Angeles, like the Caruso uh, developer group. So we began to take this kind of techniques and apply them to this idea of like how to produce high performing facades for augmented reality trackers. So the, the um, images on the left are uh, all facades which perform very poorly in Google AR cores image tracking library. Um, and the facades on the right are all ones that have gone through our, that same kind of transformative process and now are scoring at the kind of highest rate. Um, we've been testing at different scales, uh, looking at what the qualities are. Uh, maybe different than the way that we usually work with these things, they we're not really like identifying specific figures, like you know, usually you're turning like a guy's face into a lady's face or something. In this case, we're looking at more kind of abstract qualities that are underlying in the kind of machine vision of the um, the, the, uh, the AR tracker's image detection um, intelligence. So in this case, uh, the, we first kind of took, we, we've been basically taking a massive survey of a four block downtown area in Los Angeles, and we just kind of ran it roughshod over the entire thing. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, a lot of what I'm going to show, there's not a lot of, let's say, research value in it, but I like it. I like it. This is like a kind of terrible hallucination of downtown Los Angeles if the whole thing was turned into an AR tracker. So as I'm working, like, like you know, when you're working with Ben Bratton, um, always a kind of issue of politics, uh, the, narrative, the, the kind of speculative narrative about how these kind of transformations would occur. I'm obviously kind of redesigning the entire um, and renovating the entirety of downtown Los Angeles for non-human users, particularly like AR trackers. Is a, a kind of a bit of nonsense, but we began looking at it like in this case, this would be a kind of a strategy of deployment if this was like kind of a top down um, governmental imposition of a certain building code that required a kind of uniform grid of AR trackers overlaid it. Um, and this is actually using our app. And when we're, we're designing this app, um, the idea is it's not like introducing like a new um, like figure or, or pattern or something to the facade. It's the, 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 the neural net that we've developed just takes the kind of material qualities of the part of the facade and amplifies them um, and modifies some of the kind of coloration and things so that it can track better. Um, an alternative kind of narrative that we're working through, um, this is all going to kind of accumulate eventually into a, a film piece that we're, built, we're working on. 
um, is using the neural nets themselves to kind of identify compositions which maybe are like are less sensible to us from an aesthetic point of view. Um, in this case, we took the kind of same data set and taught the neural net how to identify facade regions which are underperforming for trackability, um, but are also apt for some kind of application. In this case, kind of a vinyl sticker, so it's taking those, those regions, amplifying their qualities, and then we would kind of be, we'll be prototyping this when I get back into town of kind of either vinyl sticker or a you know, robot painting it, we'll see. Um, also, we're kind of testing out this on kind of glazing, so looking at how uh, glass is kind of terrible for all of the forms of vision that we've been working with. Um, so aside from kind of removing all the windows from buildings, uh, we're looking at how we can create kind of uh, painted overlays, you know, the kind of uh, bus advertisement effect where you, we're, we're, we're going to be testing uh, with a flatbed printer on some glazing samples, you know, exactly how much transparency can we allow while still maintaining a very high score with the image tracker. <clears throat> how am I doing? We got like 10 minutes maybe? Yeah, a little bit more. Um, so all of these, all this work is being done, uh, a lot of the funding from Google was actually about just creating a really massive data set of this area. So this is one intersection out of about uh, 16. Um, and you can kind of see in the, this is a, a point cloud, um, our survey actually stops like on the, the kind of taller building um, where you can see a kind of color shift maybe halfway up. Um, and that's where our, our ability to kind of survey it uh, with our different kind of scanning techniques falls off and we're kind of augmenting it with uh, Google Earth's um, point clouds. Um, this is actually a point cloud. One of the kind of things about the workflows that we're dealing with when talking about trying to understand how you know, a neural net might engage architectural content is that things like meshes don't matter because um, we're constantly working in either kind of point cloud or uh, voxel space. Um, and this particular like sequence here, this is a kind of massive failure right now, but I, I like it, um, is beginning to try to see if we can use 3D convolutional neural networks to transform facade elements um, geometrically to improve their performance for the type of LiDAR that's used in uh, most self-driving cars except for Tesla. Elon Musk says that any self-driving car that uses LiDAR is doomed, um, but we have a LiDAR scanner, so um, we're going to just side with every other self-driving car manufacturer for the point of our research. So this is, this is a kind of a difference between a kind of architectural survey LiDAR scanner, the kind of lower level again, we're getting very, very detailed geometry, and the type of, uh, this is a Velodyne VL16 pup, which is the kind that you mount to your car, which is, um, in contrast to the other one, which takes like an hour to get that scan, this one takes like, um, it's, uh, it's running at 300 uh, revolutions per minute, which is actually pretty slow for this type of thing. And what we're doing is beginning to correlate the two different geometries and understanding uh, what types of facade materiality and what side parts of facade are geometry. The coloration in the LiDAR uh, and the Velodyne kind of LiDAR scan isn't uh, distance, it's actually energy reduction. So one of the things we're looking at is what kind of facade uh, geometries um, produce kind of low energy returns relative to their distance, kind of a low level of clarity and like parts of facades which have the greatest amount of kind of difference between like our more detailed scan and the one coming from the, uh, the Velodyne. Uh, so uh, has anyone worked with 3D neural networks before? They're kind of stuck. Like the 2D stuff works really well. The 3D stuff makes this, um, which I like, but it, uh, I'm almost 100% sure that when we run this through our uh, Velodyne again, it won't perform well as a LiDAR scanned object. The 3D neural networks have a tendency to kind of move back and forth between generating noise or kind of repetitive uh, copying of the same exact thing. Um, so regardless of it, actually, you can really see here that this almost 100% would be a terrible thing for a self-driving car to look at. Um, despite what my neural net says, there's like zero chance it could identify anything there. But uh, we liked it aesthetically, so we're going to continue developing it uh, with, within the project. There's actually the uh, elevations in the, in the school. Um, one of the things about this, um, and kind of going back to the automation, the way that we're working, and how we, we use these things in our practice, is um, looking at ways that we can use them to 
produce kind of alternative aesthetics or visualization techniques. So things like this, um, this is a kind of, uh, this is actually already a kind of de-res version of the model, are incredibly heavy to render. So what we did is we created a workflow. Um, this is the kind of drawing that's over in the show, where we could go from like a flat screenshot um, into a, a kind of, let's call it a, a neural net rendering, where it's turning kind of flat shaded things into kind of point cloud or like kind of point -to list aesthetics on the left. And the, on the one on the right is actually um, reusing the AR tracker app on, uh, to convert the one on the left to create a kind of pseudo rendering. So these aren't actually rendered. Um, they're kind of uh, basically the flat shade rough screenshot out of OpenGL that then has this kind of neural net that is amplifying the materiality and the shading and the coloration on them. So they're, they're pretty detailed images. Um, you, you start to register some of the peculiarities in the neural networks in terms of the, the kind of repetitive filters that create these gridded striations in some regions. There's a video. It looks the same as the drawing, it just moves. Um, <laughs> uh, so we, we 3D printed this guy uh, for the show, um, and then the, the security at LAX um, kind of uh, dematerialized it, thinking it was a box to open. Uh, so this is a turntable of the model that we had meant to put in the show. This um, kind of, you can really see the kind of total nonsensical um, the geometry that this thing has produced. So this is definitely going back to the drawing board in terms of the, the actual project. Uh, and I just want to close on um, this guy. This is actually older than this project, but just showing how these things are starting to play out in the way that I'm thinking about by more um, direct kind of architectural uh, uh, work. And this is a house that I was working on last year uh, in uh, kind of the 29 Palms, which is a desert outside of Los Angeles. Um, for a guy who was like in the kind of tech industry and was interested in like the, he, he was interested in the idea of utilizing, you know, convolutional neural networks and other forms of intelligent agency in the kind of a design of a house and what that would mean. Um, the project went through a whole bunch of iterations and then kind of ultimately self-combusted. Uh, but the general workflow was the same as what I was talking about before, where we have machines which are kind of analyzing the site. This is a kind of drone survey we did. It's not kind of a drone survey, it is a drone survey, sorry. Um, and then, uh, the, you know, a, a generation of, uh, of uh, the floor plan, the kind of massing, all comes from an interpretation of the site data from here, which there's not a ton of slope, but there is enough slope, and they had to be kind of wary of, like, where you place the object relative to the kind of, to the washes, because those flood out with massive amounts of water every year. But for us, what was interesting was um, when you're looking at something uh, that is assembling information out of a whole bunch of tiny kind of uh, superimposed filters or scores within a layer is that what things it, it uh, thinks are important and what they aren't. So something that's trained on kind of Miesian um, and some of our own uh, internal past projects um, reinterprets it against this landscape. Um, there's certain geometries which resonate with those kind of early modern architecture, but other things which are clearly alien to that, like the kind of lack of a totalizing grid, uh, the lack of clarity in terms of um, individual room separation. Um, and the kind of pursuit that we like in this is that it's looking at creating a kind of house through assembling materiality or density of these kind of wall-like elements um, so that spaces are kind of implied less through the kind of gestalt application that meets, but more through kind of just a kind of perspectival density. Um, and the coloration and the patterns, like we actually did this before we had compiled the research on all the kind of tracking and stuff. And we're, we're kind of pleasantly happy that um, our assumptions played out when we actually got in with the LiDAR scanner. Um, the patterning on this allows for a different interpretation of the space for something that's using LiDAR to navigate it versus the kind of human vision. And in fact, the house uh, reads as a kind of more flat geometric object to something that um, is seeing the world that way. So I just want to kind of close with this one to kind of show how um, this kind of idiosyncratic obsession over the way other things see space uh, kind of creeps back into the way that we're thinking about the architectural geometry and design itself. Um, I think that's good, yeah. So we can stay on schedule. I can, there's an example of the screenshot to rendering on a little bit higher resolution. Same thing with weird AI orgy. I like this one a lot. <laughs> This one got stuck on a loop and when I was giving a lecture in Japan and they were like freaking out trying to 
it's it's G-rated. I, like the I, there's no nothing explicit in the data set. So, um, but I think I just gonna I'll just leave this guy up. Um, this is a, this is like one small sample of that previous one before it was kind of fully trained. And to me, I actually prefer this one to the other one because I think you start to see a lot more of the kind of peculiarities and irregularities with the way a kind of convolutional neural network would be generating an image versus the other one, the kind of striations, the weird geometries. Uh, like things that are not quite right, right? These kind of flickers that are kind of telltale signs of the assembly of filters in the production of an image. Okay, thanks.